hearing of the Senate Budget Subcommittee Number One on Education. Um, we'll declare the hearing open. I want to welcome Senator Liu, who is with us. Um, Senator Weiland will be joining us uh, later in the morning. Um, at this point, today we're going to be hearing from the segments of higher education, public higher education here in California. We'll hear from the UCCSU, we'll hear from Hastings, we'll hear from briefly from the community colleges today. Um, the governor has many proposals for the universities. Uh, right now, there, there aren't a whole lot of new things in this year's budget proposals. There's some new, but not a whole lot. Uh, so we're going to talk about how things have been going and, and whether any of the new uh, proposals um, should be adopted, rejected, or held open. We're going to start um, with an item, as you'll note on your agenda, that is vote only. Um, that item is on a CSU capital outlay equipment proposal. It's a, a proposal where the, the projects are already underway, and this is a final approval of a final stage. Um, so there won't be any discussion on this. We'll just move straight to a vote. Um, I'd ask the um, a staff to please read the recommendation um, on number one. Well, it's, it's just approved as budgeted. Yeah. Okay. yeah, the, the recommendation is just approved as budgeted, and I'll ask now to call the roll. Joe? Uh, do you want it to move? Do we need well, to we, move? Do we need motion? Sure, go ahead. Okay. Senator Block? Aye. Senator Liu? Aye. Senator Wyland? Okay, show that passing 2-0, and we'll hold the roll open for Senator Wyland. Um, we'll now move to the first of our discussion items um, for today. Um, the first item is multi-year funding of and sustainability plans, part of the governor's budget. And for this item, um, we'll call up representatives from the UC, the CSU, Hastings, uh, and let's see, uh, the LAO and the Department of Finance. And we'll begin um, with a presentation from the Department of Finance. And uh, before we speak, of course, please uh, state your name for the record. Uh, Krishna Asmany with the Department of Finance. The governor's budget prioritizes higher education by funding continuation of the administration's multi-year plan for the state's public segments. Consistent with that plan, the budget appropriates approximately $3 billion general fund to both the University of California and the California State University, including augmentations to each of more than $142 million in the 14-15 fiscal year, as well as $10 million general fund for the Hastings College of the Law, including an augmentation of $1.3 million in 14-15. The administration's plan advances the state's access goals by requiring that the segments hold tuition flat through the 2016-17 fiscal year. All of the segments have announced that they will not seek a tuition increase in 14-15. Furthermore, the administration expects the UC and the CSU to continue to manage their operations within the level of resources supported by the plan and to use these resources productively, including by increasing the number of students who complete degrees, decreasing the time it takes them to complete their programs, and easing transfer for students who come from the community college and those who bring knowledge and skills from other experiences. The administration is taking a three-part approach to support progress towards these expectations. First, the administration is monitoring the performance reports submitted by the segments and the actions the universities are taking to focus attention and resources on state goals. Pursuant to provisions in the 13-14 budget, the UC and the CSU now report annually on a targeted set of performance measures, including the number of degrees awarded, their graduation rates, and their students' time to completion. Second, the budget requires the UC regents and the CSU trustees to adopt multi-year sustainability plans. These plans will be submitted to finance and the legislature by November 30th of this year and will articulate the segment's projections of their resources over a three-year period, their expenditures in each of those years, including the actions they will take to balance their budgets, the number of students they intend to enroll, and their goals for each of the state's performance measures. 
This proposal asks the segments to prioritize their funding requests using reasonable expectations of resources in future years. This would be a change in the segment's approaches to the state budget process. The universities both submitted requests for general fund growth in 14-15, twice the percentage increase in the state general fund revenues year over year. The administration's proposal now asks them to articulate the relative value of each component of their requests. The sustainability plans will inform the continuing dialogue between the administration, the legislature, and the segments about the state's priorities and provide a basis for accountability in future years. Third, the budget includes $50 million for innovation awards to recognize UC, CSU, and community college campuses that take ambitious actions to more effectively use their existing resources and to improve the productivity of the state's higher education system as a whole. We will discuss these awards in more detail in the following item. Together, these three strategies include roles for the state, the segments, and campuses in making progress toward the state's goals. This approach shifts away from the enrollment-based funding model the state has used in prior years, which requires the segments to enroll a specific number of students as a condition of receiving general fund resources. Allocating funding primarily based on the number of students enrolled creates little fiscal incentive for the universities to provide their students with the instruction and services they need to complete their programs within four years. Instead, under the administration's approach, the segments can expand access by improving outcomes. For example, reducing the time it takes existing students to graduate creates the opportunity for the universities to enroll more students. Additionally, enrollment-based funding does not encourage operational efficiency. Under the traditional approach, the state provided funding for each new student using the amount the universities are currently spending with adjustments for inflation. This approach is problematic given that the university's costs are already growing at faster rates than the state's general fund resources. We would note that the state has little ability to impact enrollment levels through the annual budget process. The universities have already made most of their decisions that will impact 2014-15 enrollment. The CSU has already announced that the university will increase enrollment in 14-15 by more than 8,000 students, which is an approximately 2% increase over 13-14 levels. The UC has indicated that it will support limited enrollment growth at the Merced campus and hold enrollment constant at the other campuses. The administration's multi-year plan provides the universities with a strong signal about future funding levels. Submitted, uh, submittal of the proposed sustainability plans will allow the administration, the legislature, and the segments to consider the number of students the universities can support as part of ongoing discussions about their longer-term resources. In closing, the governor's budget emphasizes progress towards the state goals and expects that the segments will enroll only those students for whom they can dedicate the necessary resources to support completion of relevant programs in a timely way. We believe this is a, a more sustainable approach in the long run. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you for the presentation. Um, now we'll hear from the LAO reaction to what we've just heard. Mm. Paul Goloszewski with the Legislative Analyst Office. Um, as we've testified over the past year or two, we have a couple of major concerns with the approach taken by the governor, which I'll outline first, and then I'll talk a little bit about um, performance and, and the proposed sustainability plans. So the first main concern we have with the governor's approach to funding the university is there's no real clear rationale as to why you would be providing a 5% base budget increase for each segment. Um, it's just an amount that the governor selected as an amount that he wants to fund them, but there's no real basis for it. The second concern is that there's no link between this funding that would be provided and state priorities. The funding's just provided um, on an unallocated basis for the segments to do what they want. And along with that, the budget, in our view, provides, uh, delegates too much authority to the segments. It allows the segments, uh, it has virtually no spending restrictions on any of the money that would be provided to them. And so to just give you one example of, of what happens when you take the approach um, proposed by the governor, you have 5% base increases for all segments, and yet Hastings has indicated that within the governor's plan, they're going to reduce enrollment by 10%. CSU, within the governor's plan, is going to increase enrollment 2%, and UC, within the governor's plan, would increase enrollment by a fraction of a percent. So you have all these different decisions being made based on the governor's funding amounts. Um, we think that's sort of a backwards way to go about it, and it doesn't really put the legislature in charge of these important decisions. Um, in our budget analysis, we included an alternative approach for you, which your staff included on your agenda on page 9. There's a summary table. 
I won't go into too much detail, but if you have questions or you're interested in pursuing it, please feel free to ask us more. But essentially what we've tried to do is just build a traditional workload budget, which you do for virtually all state agencies. The way that you determine the amount of funding to provide to the agencies, you look at their expected cost increases in the budget year. And we did it at a fairly high level, just looking at a couple of different categories of costs, including enrollment, which we factored into our budget model. Um, and we looked at, at um, different information regarding the needs for enrollment at each segment in order to come up with our recommendations. Um, as you can see, the total amount that we feel UCNCSU require in the budget year is a little bit higher than what the governor's proposing, but we do factor in a um, share of cost with students. Um, so the state general fund portion under our alternative would actually be less than, than what the governor proposes. Regarding the um, performance measures that were put into legislation last year, um, you have the first series of performance reports from the segments. Um, you should have received copies of those. In reviewing them, we have noticed that um, the segments UCNCSU took somewhat different approaches in some cases um, to reporting the data. Um, and that's because in some cases it wasn't defined very explicitly um, in terms of what they were supposed to report. So they made somewhat different decisions. Um, in some cases, they added additional information, um, particularly in the case of UC, they included um, 10 years of data going back 10 years, which is quite useful because you could see different trends. Um, so we're recommending to um, have the data be more consistent and improve the quality of the data. Um, you may want to direct um, staff, our office, um, Department of Finance, and the segments to come together and sort of reach agreement on what the best format is to reporting the data. And that way you'll have it more consistently um, moving forward. Um, now that you do have the performance um, outcome data the first year, um, we're recommending that you use this opportunity if you want to ask the segments um, why their graduation rates are what they are, why they have changed um, over the years, or any other um, performance measures that are in the report that you require more information about. And we we can um, assist you. We've done some preliminary analyses um, that we can also provide to you. Um, finally, regarding the proposed sustainability plans that the Department of Finance mentioned, um, the information in them would be somewhat useful, but only, again, within the context of the governor's plan. It would let you know, within the context of the governor's plan, what the segments um, plan to do. But as we're, reject as we're recommending you not um, go along with the governor's plan, it would probably be of somewhat limited um, value if you take our approach. Um, and a second concern with the sustainability plans is that they would allow the universities to set the performance targets um, for themselves. And we do think that if there are going to be targets for the performance measures, it would be better for the legislature, um, the governor, to be involved in, in determining what those targets are working with the universities. Okay, thank you. Um, and we will have questions and allow DOF, of course, to respond to some of these um, observations uh, before we finish this panel. But let's move on now to uh, Hastings, uh, to your response. Uh, thank you very much. My name is David Seward. I am the uh, Chief Financial Officer for Hastings College of Law. Um, the 2014-15 Governor's Budget is quite, I think, a, a, a good package for, for the law school. It allows us to proceed with implementation of our strategic plan, which does involve a reduction in enrollment to better align our, um, our outputs to the marketplace and to the uh, job prospects that are out there for our graduates. Uh, we have a fine student body, very dedicated, very uh, hardworking, but it is incumbent upon um, us to um, align and react to changes in the legal marketplace. The governor's budget allows us to preserve student fees at uh, flat levels for the third year consecutively. Uh, and given the high cost of attendance and concerns of student debt burden, that's an extremely favorable outcome. Uh, it allows us again to proceed with the reduction in class size. Our third and final phase uh, occurs next year with the, uh, the program reductions. Um, the budget allows us to address core needs you know, but again, not without challenges given the revenue implications of the reduction in class size. So we are uh, work with the Department of Finance collaboratively, and um, we do support the uh, funding levels proposed for the core operations. We have had 
uh, a high level of student engagement in Sacramento who have been advocating for additional programs to um, create additional opportunities for public service, um, summer programs, uh, Lawyers for America. Uh, we support those efforts wholeheartedly. Uh, those programs are not funded by the amount provided for in the governor's budget. But uh, we are continuing to work with our students uh, and members of the legislature uh, to uh, pursue those goals. So from our standpoint, the governor's budget provides stability. It provides uh, some terra firma from which to uh, engage in planning and in you know, doing some of the structural changes that we're undertaking to implement our strategic plan to better align ourselves to the uh, legal marketplace. Thank you, Mr. Seward. We'll move on now to the UC. Mr. Lenz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Patrick Lenz, I'm the Vice President for Budget and Capital Resources for the University of California. Um, and, and clearly, um, we, we see this budget season, the start of this budget season, and hopefully finish this budget season, as a far better position than we've been in for so many years that um, our level of optimism is, is very high here. And so we look forward to working with the committee and, and Department of Finance and legislative analysts on some productive outcomes here for, for the university's budget. There are recommendations from the administration as part of the governor's January budget that we, we, uh, we really like. There are LAO recommendations that we really like. Um, and like good family members, there are issues of concern that we want to uh, bring to the attention of the committee. As it pertains to the governor's budget, um, clearly this, this um, multi-year uh, approach and level of predictability is an amazing benefit to the university. And I know um, Senator Block, you and, and Senator Liu have been around long enough to remember the times of every six months, the overall general fund budget being adjusted and having a significant impact on the university's budget. Um, and, and we're happy that, that uh, for the time being, those days are, are, are behind us. Um, we uh, appreciate the uh, administration's uh, 5 percent uh, base increase, but in looking at the university's budget, clearly uh, we've got mandatory costs that surpass the 142 million that's being proposed in the governor's budget, and we have um, uh, issues of concern that we hope to be able to work with the legislature and the administration as it pertains to uh, things like uh, our, our um, uh, potential for uh, enrollment demand and enrollment growth. Um, some of our mandatory costs, uh, such as our, our retirement, and then um, the potential, hopefully, um, as we get to the May revise, with a robust May revise, of looking at an opportunity of one-time funds that might be available to the university. We think that this is a prudent approach because it doesn't overcommit the state, uh, the governor or the legislature, to ongoing commitments, but yet uh, we have some suggestions on one-time funds that we think could um, greatly assist the university in catching up some lost ground that, that we suffered, uh, particularly uh, in the areas of deferred maintenance, instructional equipment, library materials, technology, um, even addressing some, some minor cap or some of our retirement liability. As it pertains to the analyst recommendations, um, you know, certainly there's an attractive nature to the workload budget. It's something that the legislature and prior administrations have pursued uh, in taking a look at building budgets for the university. Um, uh, the recognition that uh, retirement is a mandatory cost. We don't have any way around it. We've, we're going to have to fund it one way or the other, or the $4 million on the retiree health benefits uh, is a mandatory cost is, is something that um, uh, we would agree with. There are other areas of, um, of concern, um, well, support and concern by uh, the recommendations of the LAO, but I think I'll, I'll wait on that, Mr. Chairman, until you get into those specific uh, issues in the interest of time. Um, the analyst did touch, and, and there is a great deal of interest by the legislature on performance outcome measures. As I noted to the committee last year, and as I probably note, every year we have uh, our accountability report that we provide. This is a document with over 100 different accountability measures, uh, everything from taking a look at uh, student success to the diversity of our faculty to uh, progress toward degree, and the very issues, Mr. Chairman, uh, that were uh, part of the um, ones that the legislature asked UC and CSU to report back uh, through AB 94 of, of last year. And then there's always this discussion about state priorities. And I would contend that in taking a look at the accountability report or some of the actions of the two university systems, it has been incredibly consistent with state priorities as it pertains to access, affordability, and our desire to um, serve California citizens and, and uh, ensure that uh, we can provide the state with a qualified workforce that looks at the overall economic vi uh, um, 
viability of the state in the future. So let me pause there, Mr. Chairman, but I appreciate the opportunity to make a few comments this morning. Thank you, Mr. Lance. Move now to the CSU. Good morning, Ryan Storm. I'm the uh, Interim Assistant Vice Chancellor for Budget. Uh, I just want to start off uh, echoing a lot of the same points for the CSU as Mr. Lenz uh, mentioned for the UC. Um, we're, we're greatly appreciative of the uh, administration's uh, commitment again to adding more funding to the university and sticking to their plan for the four-year, four uh, multi-year plan. And uh, it's going to help us really address some of those very critical needs that we have on, on, on our campuses and our university system. Um, but... Uh, similar to what Mr. Lenz said, you know, uh, you folks have, have, have seen the days where the general fund was, was in very bad shape, and CSU took a, a big brunt of that. And I think we did a pretty good job of, of trying to maintain that classroom element um, where we've been able to educate those students. However, one of the things that we have uh, really struggled with during, the, during these hard times are, are what I'm going to general, generally say are general infrastructure issues both people infrastructure and our actual physical infrastructure. Uh, people infrastructure, clearly it's the services and, and, and all those things that students need in order to uh, progress uh, in a timely manner through the university. Um, advising services, library services, all those support sides were really hit very hard uh, during the recession. Um, the other thing too is, is that we have a, a huge inventory of, of uh, physical infrastructure and IT infrastructure that's very dated. Um, about half of our buildings are well over 40 years, and we have a, a very large deferred maintenance uh, backlog on our campuses. And it's a really, it's a real big concern. Um, you've probably seen plenty of, plenty of press releases or press articles lately about, you know, one building after another going down, or one piece of infrastructure or another going down um, at each of our universities. And it's a, it's a, it's a really big deal. Um, but I, I will say that. Um, Went segueing over to, to our request and, and our budget that we have put together back in November and was approved by our trustees. Um, I would say that our proposal is, is pretty, uh, uh, pretty, uh, pretty in line with the resources available to the state. We, I, don't, I don't believe our proposal is, is some big giant Christmas tree that we've lit up with a number of um, really great wants that we have, but I think it's really trying to reinvest and and really trying to get to the point where we can start building upon uh, that, that new base that we have out there. Um, just for example, um, just on the enrollment piece alone, I think we've, we've basically uh, pitched, pitched the idea that um, um, we'll, we'll talk about the you know, marginal cost and enrolling more students and, and, and that a little bit later. But I think what it shows in our proposal is that we're taking at it, looking at it from a very practical perspective, that we do realize that, that we could add more students and could do it um, in, a, in a more cost-efficient way. But we're doing that kind of on a one-time basis to realize that you know, the state is just starting to reinvest in, in, the, in the CSU. And um, obviously, uh, we would definitely uh, like to have more funding to, to add to the quality of our institution, but I think our request on the enrollment side is really kind of a bare bones approach that we've requested from you. So that's just one example of it. Um, anyway, um, segueing over then to, um, to, to our ask, uh, I, I think uh, all of you have probably been, been visited by somebody from the CSU, either a, 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 an indirect stakeholder, direct stakeholder, or um, one of us that work for the CSU in the request for the $95 million more than what um, was provided in the governor's budget. I think uh, we've, we've, we talked about a little bit yesterday um, in the assembly budget subcommittee hearing and how um, the, the notion of uh, funding kind of ebbs and flows with recessions and, and, and better times. And we're in a better time as a state. And um, this is a good time to, to retool. The, the, the major concern that we have is, is that if, we, if there isn't that reinvestment on the state side, that we could easily walk into the next recession in that much worse of shape. Um, and uh, the last thing I want to point out too is, is on, on kind of our front is, is that again we have uh, stuck with the notion of sticking to a, a freeze on our increases to any tuition fees. Uh, we're trying to do that from, uh, from a vantage point of not harming our students uh, fiscally and trying to live within our means. Um, one thing, a couple things I wanted to mention about the administration's proposals very briefly. Um, I think on the sustainability plans, uh, it's, it's generally a good next step forward to always 
talk about what, what goals we should establish. And I appreciate the ability for us as a system to establish our own goals. We have a lot of our own efforts to try to improve uh, our students' uh, achievement. We have our early assessment program done in the K-12 realm. We have our early start program for those folks who need some additional help before they start taking college level courses. We also have our graduation initiative that really creates uh, graduation targets by campus in order to graduate those students as, as efficiently as possible. And I think this is a, it's a good next step from a state perspective to look at it from that vantage point. Um, I will caution you though that if we are going to operate off of the assumption of working with the revenues that the administration are proposing over the next couple of years, I think it'll be very hard for um, our system, and I don't want to speak on behalf of UC, it'd be really hard to really depict um, a situation where we could live without, with, with just the, the 5544 plan of the administration and show that we're able to really meet all of those critical needs that we've outlined in our November budget. Um, the other thing about the, the innovation grants, uh, I think uh, there's still a lot of discussion internally within the, within the CSU about how best to approach those. Um, we're having meetings, um, we already have meetings scheduled about how best to tackle that, and so I won't be able to um, provide any, a lot of detail on that, on that initiative. Um, I think one thing on the LAO front um, that, that we'll agree with is, is that we do have a number of students that have been uh, what we call denied eligibles, students that are fully qualified to attend the CSU, and for space uh, constraints and other factors, they're unable to actually attend the, the university. We appreciate the fact that the LAO recognizes that there is a pent-up demand for our university and for our campuses, and um, we will just have to quibble a little bit about how, how many more people we could add and, and that sort of thing. But I think they're on the right trajectory in terms of the concept of you know adding more students to the system. Um, and I think the 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 while I appreciate the idea of building a workload budget out of the LAO's recommendation, I think that 2.2 percent increase that what was provided is really uh, really tough for us to handle considering that we have those years of, of tough times and, and starting fresh at that really low point really makes it that much more difficult, the amount of funding. With that, I'll, I'll stop for now and then we'll... Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you, Mr. Storm. Um, and I want to thank all of you. You know, over the last few years, the governor's office, the legislature, and the segments have worked together to make really tough cuts uh, without destroying access and, and affordability and, and quality, more importantly probably, than anything else, quality's remained high. Um, now that we've got a little bit of um, revenue coming in, um, it's maybe a tougher job to decide what to restore first or what new programs to, to create. Um, one, one comment, uh, Mr. Storm, you made was that the CSU is going to abide by uh, the governor's wish to not raise tuition or fees and has been abiding by it. Yet I've read that on several campuses now, there are additional campus-based fees um, which allegedly are approved by the students, but in fact, at least on some campuses, there are focus groups of like 30 students out of 35,000 who approve this, and the other 34,970 have no say. Um, so could you discuss how that fits within the Governor and Department of Finance's a mandate that fees not be increased? Sure. I think uh, there are a couple points I want to point out with this. Um, First and foremost, these are um, these are fees that are that are driven from the bottom up. They're from the campus themselves and raised up to the chancellor for his approval. But I think one of the really key points that I want to make on this is that these student success fees that are originated at the campuses are really, in a way, a symptom and not the cause. The, they are a symptom of the fact that for for several years now, students have had that those limited resources to be able to to work with in a lot, you know, since the recession began. It's really a symptom of the fact that we've, we've kept tuition flat um, in, the, in recent years and, the, and, and frankly, the state has not been able to reinvest very well in, in, the, in the university. We're, get, we're turning the tide, it's, it's looking better, but it's more of a symptom. Um, and, and frankly, I think what, what you see with that is, is that um, all of these universities are creating these, um, these fees uh, very uniquely to, to meet the individual needs of each of their campuses. CSU is a federation, right? So we, we have a loose federation with, um, with, our, with our campuses, and each one has these fees that are tailored to the particular needs. <laughs> I think one of the more um, mature ones of these success fees that I've looked at a little bit closely is Northridge. 
And you'll see there that a lot of the money that is being collected for those fees really go to, to things that really supplement the, the academic program. Uh, one thing that I think really sticks out in my mind is this notion of um, inter, uh, internet connectivity. A lot of classwork and a lot of work that's done right now is, is, is done collaboratively versus maybe when I was in college where you write your paper, you turn it in, and, and that's, your, that's, your, that's your deal. But in visiting Northridge and actually discussing these success fees, one of the things that was really brought to the attention of the folks that were, that were um, um, related to the fee was that, well, there, there's a greater need to have Internet connectivity so that the folks can work on their projects and that sort of thing. So that success fee actually pays for that sort of uh, interconnectivity so that students can work all over the place on the campus. Okay, let, me, let me get to the base of the question. Sure, it's go not, ahead. Sure. Uh, the chair doesn't question whether the, the fees are legitimately needed or used for legitimate purposes. Mm -hmm. um, the question is, can you say fees haven't increased when they have? Um, and I'd ask the Department of Finance to comment on that from the governor's perspective. Well, I don't think it's a uh, campus-based fees aren't a component or a condition of receipt of funds under the administration's proposal. But I do think, I think we think we're uncomfortable with it, and we think it's problematic given that part of the intent of holding, uh, of providing steady general fund increases and holding tuition flat is to encourage the universities to control costs and to figure out how do you run a university under a sustainable long-term uh, level of resources. So we are, you know, uh, we don't, we're not conditioning future increases on increases um, on holding campus-based fees flat, but we are concerned about it. 